Well, thank you for being here this afternoon. As, uh, as Joan said, I'm Stephen Vold, and I'm visiting here from Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the newer laser technologies that we can use in laser trabeculoplasty. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. And uh, as you know, there's now a, a wide range of different treatment options available for initial therapy. We know from looking at compliance data that patients really struggle with their medications. In fact, uh, when looking at persistency data, which is really how many refills patients do over the course of the first year, the best data that we can get is about 60% at one year with the drug latanoprost. So that means the vast majority of our patients are really not doing very well with their medicines, especially when they're on multiple medications. We have other, in addition to medications, we have laser trabeculoplasty, which has been around for a long time. We've been revisiting this here in recent years, and I think there's more and more people using this technologies uh, and this approach to treating uh, uh, glaucoma early on in the disease, especially in early to moderate uh, disease, uh, as uh, compliance is a real issue for folks. Also, we have a lot of new minimally invasive or microinvasive uh, glaucoma surgeries that are available now that also are being used earlier in the treatment uh, paradigm. Filtration surgery is still relatively uh, used in advanced glaucoma. Why trabeculoplasty first? Uh, medical compliance, we talked about forgetfulness, side effects. I think cost of uh, the topical medications is becoming increasingly uh, uh, a big issue for patients. The efficacy of uh, the procedure is another reason why people do this. We've really found that we can get 80 to 90% success rate in the first year with, with a single uh, treatment uh, with laser trabeculoplasty. Also, quality of life issues. We know that there's a lot of uh, potential adverse events uh, and, and side effects from these medications. And for a lot of people, uh, this can really enhance the quality of their life, not to mention the, the local effects such as ocular surface disease, so they can actually see better. We have some different options available to us currently. Uh, these include uh, argon laser trabeculoplasty, which was really the first kid on the block. There's selective laser trabeculoplasty, which has become a very common thing and used in, uh, in the, uh, the glaucoma practice as well as comprehensive ophthalmologist hands as well. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a bit uh, about as well today the micropulse diode laser trabeculoplasty and a couple different options that Iridex offers that I think are, are really unique and really can be helpful to you in your practice. First, I'd just kind of like to review and go back and help us get our arms around uh, the value of laser trabeculoplasty. And uh, we'll start with uh, where we started in the beginning, which is the argon laser. We'll talk briefly about the pathophysiology, some of the techniques that have been used in the past, their results, and what we've used as kind of as a barometer for success in this treatment. Also, some of the contraindications and complications that have been associated with laser trabeculoplasty in the past. Early on, we really subscribed to the, the mechanical theory, which was an opening of the aqueous channels by the trabecular meshwork tissue shrinkage. Interestingly, as we did histopathologic studies, this really wasn't very well supported at all. And so what we've learned is that there's probably a cellular or biologic theory that was more accurate in this situation. We have migration of macrophages, which has been demonstrated on uh, pathology, which may clear debris in the trabecular meshwork. Trabecular cell division has been enhanced and been shown to do this on uh, pathology slides. The expression of interleukin-1 and, and tumor necrosis factor alpha may increase um, expression of strombolysin in juxtacanalicular trabecular meshwork. There's also been an upregulation of the trabecular meshwork met matrix metalloproteinases. So how do we handle these patients? Uh, generally what we've done in the past is treated uh, before and sometimes even after with an alpha agonist, whether it's uh, brimonidine or apoclonidine. Uh, there's a number of different lenses out there, including the, including the golden or rich. Uh, there's other ones that, such as the latina as well, which is a possibility. And what really what we do is we locate the trabecular meshwork landmarks in the nasal or inferior quadrant first. And the reason we look there first is because there's more pigment there. We use ice packs uh, potentially if uh, we need to, if there's uh, pressure spikes that we're concerned about, especially in patients that are on three or four medications. And uh, topically afterwards, a lot of times people were using either non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or, or potentially a topical steroid. Uh, here are some of the lenses. You get the Goldman lens on the, on the right, the gonia lens there, and uh, the rich trabeculoplasty lens on the right. And again, with this, you're gonna need a methyl cellulose solution or something as a uh, coupling agent uh, to the cornea. Early on, a lot of folks were doing 180 degrees. I think a lot of folks were using a 360 over time 
uh, as we, but we lowered the power levels. About 20 to 25 uh, laser spots per quadrant have been advocated. Laser burns were equally spaced at the anterior half of the trabecular meshwork. And really what we're looking for is really the area of the pigmented trabecular meshwork. We didn't want to go too posterior because then you can end up with posterior synechiae or peripheral anterior synechiae, excuse me, and uh, this can imp potentially impact outcomes as well. The Argonne green wavelength was used, uh, I, I can remember early on in my training, we were actually using a blue-green uh, laser, but we were real concerned about the, actually the impact of surgeon's eyes as well. Typically, a 50 micron spot size is, it was advocated with a 0.1 second per burst with 400 to 1,000 milliwatts of power, depending on the efficacy of your laser. As you can see here, this is kind of how this procedure looked. Uh, you can see if we got on the, the posterior uh, edge of the trabecular meshwork, those patients were a little more prone to, to anterior synechiae. We like to get on the anterior side, and obviously we don't want to be on the cornea. And as you can see, with the argon laser, we would look for little kind of champagne-like bubbles and a little blanching of the tissue. And you can see this here uh, on the right, where well, this is what the tissue would look really shortly after uh, argon laser trabeculoplasty. As far as the results, what we found was that there was no uniform de definition for success. 90% uh, have IOP lowering at one year, roughly 50% at five years, and, and anywhere in that, you know, about a third is what I kind of quote to my patients at 10 years. And so this is something that clearly does lose its effect with time. The optimal IOP lowering effect occurred by four to six weeks. And a lot of times we'll see effects early, but one thing I've learned over the years, it's important that we watch these patients because a lot of times there will be some improvement over those, that first month or so. Uh, multiple factors affect the success. So for instance, people that have more pigmented uh, trabecular meshwork tend to do better with this. I think people as they're a little more elderly tend to do better as far as the real young folks, it's not a great treatment. African Americans tend to do extremely well with this as uh, uh, shown in the advanced glaucoma intervention study. Some of the factors influencing uh, ALT success, as we were talking about, uh, pre-treatment IOP certainly was one thing. If it's really super high, you may not get down where you want to be. Uh, if they're um, phakic, sometimes uh, that they would do a little bit better if there was, as opposed to someone who had a lot of inflammation after cataract surgery. I will tell you, with modern cataract surgery, pseudophake patients tend to do very well with this procedure as well. Again, the pigmentation of the patient, age of the uh, patient as well, the type of glaucoma. Uh, pigmentary uh, glaucoma is a, are some patients that tend to do very well. I will tell you, pseudoexfoliated uh, syndrome is another group of patients that I find to do extraordinarily well. In fact, for me, for pseudo, pseudoexfoliated glaucoma, that is oftentimes the very best treatment I can give uh, starting out of the blocks. Uh, obviously, if they had previous uh, ocular surgery, depending on what they've had done before, that can make a difference in the impact of the, uh, of the efficacy and uh, potential complications after treatment. The glaucoma laser trial was a, a NIH-funded study, a really an important trial that was performed a, a good number of years ago. But what they proposed was uh, as argon laser trabeculoplasty as initial glaucoma therapy, and really the first big study looking at this matter. 44% of the patients were controlled uh, uh, as far as an ILP level without medications at two years. So you can see uh, a lot of these folks did need medicines. And interestingly, it's 70% of patients were controlled by AT alone or with Timolol. So either the laser alone or an adjunct uh, Timolol treatment at two years. And there's been a lot of debate as to how this uh, study has been used. The one thing we do know that there are definitely patients that benefit from this kind of treatment. As far as contraindications, obviously an uncooperative patient where you can't uh, get uh, good treatment or we want to make sure we're accurate in our, our precision of our laser treatments. Inadequate visualization, angle closure, uveitic glaucoma, angle recession glaucoma doesn't work so well because there's a lot of scarring in the drain already. It can actually predispose you to a post-operative IOP spike. Juvenile glaucoma doesn't work so well. And I, I do think that with, if you use lower energy levels, you can do it in people that have had previous uh, laser trabeculoplasty, but that certainly is, is a risk for a, a post-operative IOP spike. As far as complications associated with ALT, elevated IOP up to 50% if untreated, uh, progressive visual field loss, PAS, anterior uveitis, uh, sector sphincters pupillary palsies, hemorrhage, corneal edema, and endothelial burns, uh, even syncope or vasovagal response. And as I, the reason I show you this kind of this history is I want you to understand that this is kind of how things have been done in the past. 
and, and really present a significant dichotomy as to what we have available to us now, especially with these new micropulse lasers. And we're going to talk about that here coming up. Selective laser trabeculoplasty, I think for a lot of people, has replaced the argon laser. That had been kind of the next iteration This has been uh, that uh, people had gotten into. Uh, they used a, a low energy Q switch frequency doubling uh, laser. It's got comparable in efficacy to ALT, but may have a, a much higher uh, retreatment success rate. There's been some papers looking at that that seem to indicate that. Uh, allows for selective destruction of pigmented uh, trabecular meshwork cells without thermal or collateral damage. Uh, the nice thing about this, you have a fixed spot size, it's 400 microns, you're treating a larger area of the trabecular meshwork. You have a fixed uh, time, uh, three nanos, uh, na nanoseconds, and we're going to basically be able to treat larger areas of the trabecular meshwork in uh, confluent or just uh, um, treatment, so you can really treat the entire trabecular meshwork. You adjust the power to a slight blanch of trabecular meshwork or adjust a, a, a very small bubble for formation. In more pigmented eyes, I'll start about 0.8 millijoules. Uh, I will tell you for, uh, for standard pigmentation uh, where you have just moderate pigmentation, a lot of times a joule will be uh, to 1.2 joules is probably is best uh, for treatment. Uh, I personally treat for about 360 degrees, uh, certainly can treat for less as well if you need to. And this really leads us to the, the micropulse diode laser trabeculoplasty. And Irinex offers really two good options here. We have the 810 uh, micropulse uh, or uh, micrometer nanometer IQ Irinex laser. This is a really, a, I mean, a great laser for those of you that take a lot care of a lot of glaucoma. It's a fantastic laser in that it really does a nice job. It can cut sutures. Uh, for me, one of the big advantages of it is that I can use it for cyclodestruction or cyclophotocoagulation. And with transillumination, it is an absolutely fantastic laser. Uh, it also can be certainly done for retinal applications as far as, uh, you know, from uh, grid treatment and, and also uh, peripheral uh, retinal treatment, for instance, panretinal photocoagulation if needed. And you can use it to close uh, retinal tears and things like that. So as far as a, a portable, really stealth laser, this is a fantastic one. More recently, this past year, I, I have gotten the, the 532 nanometer micropulse ophthalmic laser. And I'll just tell you, this has been an absolute unbelievable thing in our practice. Not only is it great for using it for, for laser trabeculoplasty, and this has really become my laser of choice for laser trabeculoplasty, I also can use it for patients with macular edema and diabetics. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't give you these big laser burns. It really gently tickles the, uh, the, the RP. It can actually be a very effective in the treatment of, of macular edema, both in the diabetic and, uh, and cystoid macular edema patients. It treats the deeply pigmented cells of the trabecular meshwork through laser-induced thermal elevation. It may provide the same ILP lowering effects as ALT and SLT, but again, you're using less energy and, and less inflammation. So really, this is the kindest, gentlest laser that is, that is currently available, and yet you're still not going to be uh, sacrificing efficacy. Some of the definitions here, just to kind of compare and contrast, SLT is a large spot laser just uh, like the MLT that uses a single 3 nanometer second, 532 nanosecond laser pulse to selectively destroy pigment trabecular meshwork cells uh, in, in accordance with the principle of selective photothermal uh, lysis. Again, MLT is a large spot procedure that uses a train of low irradiance, 300 micro, uh, microsecond, uh, 810 nanometer laser pulses or 532 uh, nanometer laser pulses, depending on which laser you're using, to thermally affect not to destroy the pigmented trabecular meshwork cells. And as you can see on histopathology here, there's a significant difference between the laser burn that you'll see with an argon laser and what you're going to see with a micropulse laser. With this micropulse laser, you, you really see in a completely intact uh, um, trabecular meshwork architecture, really no signs of coagulation. Uh, and as you can see in the, uh, on the upper picture here with the argon laser, it's kind of like a little uh, nuclear warhead that just hit the trabecular meshwork. As far as the technique, again, I personally prefer 360 degrees of treatment. I like to go confluent. I do about 100 spots uh, overall, so it's about 25 spots uh, per quadrant. I use a 300 micron spot size. And generally, I start with the 700 milliwatt power. Uh, and, and folks that, uh, that have a little less pigment, I may actually go up to about a, a, mil, a full watt. Uh, again, I'll tell you right now, you don't even see any bubbles, anything like this. 
it, it is a very, very gentle procedure. And one of the things I think for a lot of people, it just takes a little while just to kind of figure out where to titrate this. And I'm going to be putting together, I'm collecting this data and, and like to publish this and uh, in the future uh, present that to you to really show you how the efficacy uh, parallels what is uh, with other technologies. Again, we're using uh, 100 micros pulses, and I use a 15% duty cycle. Again, no visual um, signs of treatment. Could they cue the video? I'd just like to uh, show folks uh, what that looks like in the clinic. And, and you can see here uh, how nice the size of this, uh, this beam is. And you can do this very rapidly. It just takes rather just a matter of a couple minutes in the clinic, and you can go all the way around. I like to start inferiorly just because that's where you can see the landmarks the best. And this is exactly what you see under the uh, uh, under the slit lamp. It's really a gorgeous laser. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to the presentation here. What differentiates uh, micropulse laser trabeculoplasty from uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty? Again, it does not produce the, photo, the selective photothermolysis. It uh, theoretically interacts with the pigmented cells in all layers of the trabecular meshwork. So in theory, we might potentially even have a better treatment effect. Um, also, uh, you have a little bit more control over the parameters with the MLT. You can power on and off. The, you can uh, affect the duty cycle. You have just a little bit more control. Uh, there, believe it or not, you can actually automate this thing so the certain times so you can actually kind of like with the retina, you can you know, put it on a sustained pulse speed, can do that for you. Uh, it also uh, uh, is uh, really, without question, I think that the least uh, iatrogenic as far as tissue damage. What do they have in common? They're both uh, easy to learn. They both have large spots pr procedures. Lower IOP as effectively as thermal ALT minimal post-operative complications. One of the things that I've been find very nice with about with the micropulse style laser trabeculoplasty is uh, with uh, the laser with the argon and even with selective laser trabeculoplasty I was more prone to using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines. I have to tell you with MLT I don't use anything. I really just have found that I don't need it and so uh, for patients they really don't need to be on any post-operative drops at all and they really like that. Um, again, we're trying to reduce dependence on topical glaucoma medication. It can be used earlier in the glaucoma uh, treatment paradigm. And, and without question, this is extremely well uh, uh, tolerated by patients. There is absolutely no pain with there. If you've used an anesthetic drug, the only thing they're going to feel is just that lens on their eye, when you just like standard gonioscopy. And as you guys know, with argon laser trabeculoplasty, that's not the case. And even with SLT, you could definitely have a little discomfort, if you, especially if you're on a little on the higher end of the powers. Again, the app, uh, mechanism of action is very similar. Uh, but again, we're really trying to, uh, to stimulate a cellular cascade to clean out the trabecular meshwork. And I can't underestimate one of the things I think sometimes docs do is they haven't come back in a, a, a couple days and, oh, it's not working. Give it that four to six weeks to get that full impact of the effect because that really does make a difference. Uh, now, a lot of folks won't respond early on. I will tell you for me how I do it in my practice. I do MLT one day. I have them come back a week later. We'll do the other eye. Uh, and then I'll have them off. oftentimes after that. I'll either see them a week after that or even potentially a little farther out in, in two to three weeks. The nice thing about this uh, procedure is the risk of having a post-op IOP spike it is extremely low, and, and I'll just tell you right now, I've often wondered, do I even really need, I've always kind of used the, the perioperative uh, brimonidine in the office. To be honest with you, because this is a kind, such a kind, gentle procedure, I'm not 100% sure that I really need to do that. I, I do uh, be err on the side of caution at the present time. In summary, laser trabeculoplasty is a reasonable initial glaucoma treatment option. MLT causes list, uh, less tissue damage than SLT or ALT and appears to be repeatable. Uh, patient selection is critical in determining patient out uh, procedure outcomes. And lastly, most patients will ultimately require additional therapy, and, and this is really based on, on the data from the glaucoma laser trial. Thank you very much.